Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd, and welcome to a new episode of the Needle Drop podcast. And on this new episode, we have a special interview guest, Mr. Neil Cesaregan, artist who has seen success in numerous mediums, including music, puppetry, and sketch comedy, though he came to my attention last year through two fantastic mashup albums, Mouth Sounds and Mouth Silence, two of my favorite records of that year for their really catchy songs, their sense of humor, as well as their completely unexpected fusions of Michael Jackson, Nirvana, Daft Punk, Foo Fighters, the <laughs> Folgers Coffee theme song, Chumbawamba, and of course Smash Mouth, and I am having Neil on the show now to talk about nostalgia, comedy, music, and a bunch of other, I guess, philosophical, conceptual BS that surrounds these things, especially when you fuse them together, bleh, especially when you fuse them together. Neil, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this this is this has been a long time coming for, for for me anyway. It's it probably hasn't been for you, but ever since I, I I heard these two mashup records, I don't know. I just I just feel like I had to throw some questions into the insane brain that was responsible for them and just kind of see what came out. Well, I was yeah, I was surprised to find your reviews. I uh, I guess it was a, a sort of legitimacy that. They hadn't been given quite yet. I don't know. Like, uh... okay. So, I mean, l l l let me throw this question at you. Okay. S sort of get the <laughs> the artist's perception of their art here. Okay. These mashups that land on these two albums um, are they bad? And have I ruined my career by endorsing them? I don't think they're bad. Uh, <laughs> um. Oh, hang on a second. I have to turn my microphone down a little bit. Okay. Um, I, I, guess, I guess what I'm asking is, are they in bad taste? Because <laughs> it seems like in, in, in one hand, while you readily admit that, on the other hand, there seems to be an incredible amount of, of effort and detail that goes into a, a lot of these tracks. I mean, I think anybody who sort of mashes together songs or sort of uh, understands things like musical theory would appreciate the difficulty of assembling all the musical pieces that you do on a song like Best, for example. Yeah, most of them don't start off at like in the idea phase or just they, 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 or they they're not intended to become good in any way at the start. And I, like, I don't have any pretense of it being a danceable song or a sonically interesting song, uh, especially in like with the Smash Mouth stuff. That's all. Especially that is just like, I think it would be funny, uh, like on a fart level to you know take this song and put Smash Mouth in it. Hmm. Um, and some of them are just that. They're just they're just like the mashup version of a fart joke. Like I said. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and others, I kind of hit on something that sounds good to my ear and I decide to put a little more work into it or to start putting instruments or, or, or ideas that I actually do like genuinely and don't feel like are jokes, but there's always a joke kind of buried in the center of it. I don't, uh, I don't know how it keeps happening like that, but that's how those... Uh, mashups that were originally just like one-off songs that I'd post as a joke on Tumblr became concept albums that are, you know, an hour long each. Hmm. And uh, what sort uh, sort of hearing you call them concept albums right there is something that would have never occurred to me to sort of throw onto it. Uh, is is there a concept to these two records that sort of moves beyond? the fact that there is really a strong element of comedy at the core of a lot of these tracks? Well, I, I don't understand. I think there's there's two different kinds of concept albums. In my mind, there's the like lyrical concept albums that are like telling a story, and hmm. the songwriter like had basically wants to write a movie but or a musical or something, but they, they are just making an album that strings together. And then there's albums that flow together and have interesting track transitions and reprise certain themes 
And it's more of that kind of concept album where it all it just like gels together um, a little better than an assortment of 12 tracks normally would. Sure. And I've always really enjoyed that kind of album. Um, and my original music does that a lot too. Uh, and and I, I just like when I was compiling all the joke songs I made together and I first got the idea to like, well, maybe I could kind of make a big mixtape or an album out of these. That's when I started to think of interesting ways to uh, just like repeat jokes and build jokes over the album. And um, it was kind of a, yeah, it was kind of a quick process. Well, also, uh, I, I think something that should be mentioned in, in the same breath as those things are just kind of all of the uh, very... <laughs> sly hilarious subliminal ways you kind of incorporated smash mouth into the uh mouth silence side of these two uh uh mashup records yeah that was um most of that was like the last thing i did to the album Uh um i when i after i finished mouth sounds and half of it is smash mouth mashups uh i Decided, like, I wanted to do another one, but I didn't want to do a Smash Mouth joke again. I wanted to consciously put no Smash Mouth in it and see if it could stand on its own without that hook. Hmm. Uh, And then at the last minute... As if Smash Mouth were really a hook to begin with. I think that's kind of what people sold it on. Uh, They sold it on that premise, like, check out this mashup album that's all Smash Mouth. It's just like... Well, okay, I'll, I have to check that so, out. So there, so there was a moment where you were like, are people listening to this because of my talent, or are they really just listening to it for the Smash Mouth? Yes. I definitely... You just moment. doubted yourself for that one moment. Not doubt, but it was more of a curiosity to see if I could uh, accomplish the same kind of humor without leaning on this one song repeating over and over. Mm-hmm. And I like uh, I like Mouth Silence better as an album. I think because of that, uh, mm-hmm. because there's there's a, there's twice as many artists that I sample on it, and it's uh, it's a little more intricate, just in in terms of um, like sourcing and and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, the last thing I did um, when I was just like mastering and mixing that album was. Uh, figure out a bunch of ways that I could subliminally put Smash Mouth into the album without it being a direct sample. And uh, one of them was slowing down Uh, Mm. (laughs) All-Star. Slowing down All-Star as slow as I could so that you can't tell what it is. It just sounds like deep, low grumbles. But without losing quality so that you could speed it back up and hear it distinctly. And I found points in the album where there was kind of a lull in the music and I could just throw that in there and see if anyone figured it out. And it took a few months, but someone did finally realize what was going on there. Yeah. Uh, uh, the little subliminal cues, just, uh, uh, when, when, when somebody on YouTube sort of pulled them all together, it was actually, uh, uh, pretty much this aha moment. Um, and and I agree for the most part that that I do enjoy uh, <laughs> mouth silence a little more. Not necessarily because of the lack of Smash Mouth, but I, I think uh, some of your mashups on that record are uh, uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, sort of how you pull, um, uh, especially Elton John together with uh, System of a Down, and. Uh, Katy Perry with uh, Kate Bush, yeah, and uh, it's 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 spots like that 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 make me feel like in a way, uh, even though there is definitely a, a really strong element of humor about these two records, what what is really worth kind of taking seriously about them is that I think consistently they sort of push the idea of the mashup a little bit further in ways that I don't think most people think of them. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure mashups like these have turned up before in fact i know that that's the case but it seems like for the greater part of the last 15 years or so the idea of the mashup has been basically sort of based on take a pop song take a rock song take an indie song just you know try to pull together as many instrumental bits from it as you can and then throw a hip-hop verse over it whereas that's something you just completely avoid on these two projects 
Yeah, I uh, like. I have nothing against hip hop. It's a like as a as a genre, but as a mashup element, I uh, don't like to use uh, you know like rap songs or anything because it's almost too easy to slot you know rapped vocals over uh, other music, um, and it can sound great. But I'm not I'm not going for great. I'm going for uh, weird challenges and personal. Uh, um, it's like personal goals of making two totally different melodies work together. So I have, I keep finding myself uh, trying to pick songs from totally different genres or decades or even time signatures and make them work together. And yeah, like the, the B 52 is one with the psycho is kind of like the ultimate example <laughs> of that. It, but it's <laughs> but it's it's fittingly weird i mean it's it's maybe not one of my favorite tracks off of mouth silence but it's def it's easily like you were just saying one of the more challenging and stranger tracks on the entire record uh even if not everything is working as it should musically just tone wise the the way the strings kind of work <laughs> against fred schneider's vocals on that track yeah. it just makes him seem really Odd, or maybe I think it brings out a kind of off the wall eeriness that I think his voice has always had, but never was quite so apparent under the B-52's kind of funky drums and guitars. Yeah, and that song especially is kind of aggressive. It's <laughs> uh, it like really wants you to dance, like just violently. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was actually like the second or third song i tried against the psycho theme hmm. i i think i just got it into my head that pop vocals would work over the psycho theme but i was trying to figure out uh what song would work and i think i tried like pretty fly for a white guy at some point and eh, it wasn't quite working and then i figured out the that love shack also uh not only worked close enough melodically and tempo wise but it was also about a shack out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> which is what psycho is about so i was like okay this is perfect i need this to happen yeah and i well, didn't have to do that much i think i want to say it was almost in the same key or i had to pitch it up or down a note and i only had to loop maybe a measure of the psycho theme to make it all fit together without changing much at all uh-huh and it, sort of talking about how you're kind of going through these moments where you're trying different pop songs or different songs together and sort of, uh, I guess, not coming out the results that you want is, is sort of coming together with these songs. I imagine that there's a lot of skill involved in the, the, the final moments of actually piecing everything together and getting it to really sync up. But as far as like trying to find two or three or five songs that work together. Is it just kind of like a lot of shots in the dark up until the point where, aha, these actually kind of fit or these songs are close enough to the point where I can sort of make it happen with a little pitch shifting and a little tempo adjustment. Yeah. I, I think when I started doing mashups, um, I started out by just coming up with the idea for it somehow and then kind of forcing it to work through like no matter how much I had to pitch alter the pitch of a song or anything I I just I'd pick two songs I'd find out if I could find the stems the uh, like the vocal tracks and stuff and then I would just make it happen because it's just a joke and it's just smash mouth and who cares uh, <laughs> and those are good like the um, the one that's imagine and smash mouth I, I pitched the smash mouth vocal <laughs> down like half an octave yeah and <laughs> I'm sure people noticed, but it also feels right because he's got kind of that that deep rumbly voice anyway. So, mm -hmm. and it's also again, it's a fart joke, so it's okay if it sounds like a weird monster. Uh, but but later on, I discovered this gigantic collection of all the uh, multi tracks that people had ripped from the Rock Band games, hmm. and um, someone had stuck just like hundreds and hundreds of these multi-tracks for all sorts of songs together in this one archive and I found it and I like bookmarked it as quick as I could and I just started 
downloading anything I was interested in, even just to listen to and to like just like listen to the synths on their own. And so so that was um, just like a huge uh, collection of sources for me to play around with, and that kind of changed how I did it. So now I just have a, a whole bunch of songs. Really? And so that's how you came into all those stems? Yeah, they're, I think, mostly from Rock Band or Guitar Hero. Some of them are from, uh, like, you know, obscure, you know, someone will release an instrumental track and then someone would use that to kind of cancel out the instruments. And, mm. um, uh, But yeah, most of it is from Rock Band, as far as I can tell. And that's perfect because Rock Band is loaded with 90s one hit wonders who are trying to squeeze an extra buck out of their you know their songs so mm. it really fit in with the albums that i wanted to make and the songs that and the references that i wanted to invoke yeah it's it seems like uh, not only is there kind of an element of comedy to a lot of these tracks but sort of an element of uh, of, of nostalgia as well yeah uh, a big part of that is just that i uh I don't listen to a ton of new music um, just because uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I like older music and I rem- I have stronger memories of uh, when I was younger and I before I really got into music and I would just listen to whatever was on the radio and that happened to be late 90s, uh, you know, top 40 stations. So I, I, I just, I, I have a strong memory of all these silly songs that, you know, (laughs) that got overplayed. And I know that enough people in my age range have the same associations with them that I can just, you know, I can drop Rob Thomas into a song and most everybody will know what I'm referencing and they'll know why it's funny because they heard that song a million times when they were 12. I I hated those Rob Thomas songs so much when I was a kid. I, I just yeah. I just did not. <laughs> I don't think I was a fan, but I looking back, I can see the strength of it, and I keep coming back to that particular song because because uh, it was such a force to be reckoned with. It it was. I mean, smooth that that song with Santana. That song was everywhere, man. That, that yeah, and like live in La Vida Loca. I like, wish I, I haven't done that one yet. <laughs> which def, definitely something to keep in mind for the next project. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I have like that, a little list of things. If I ever, if I do a third album, I'll I'll probably go please, to those. Please, please do make sure to uh, reference the swing revival as well of the '90s. We we can't yeah. we can't let that go unforgotten. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> so you're you're talking about how some of these songs you you sort of have to piece them together with a little bit of manipulation others sort of seem to slip together a bit more easily but there are tracks on here at at least to my ear and and correct me if 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 you feel that i'm wrong Mm -hmm. but it seems like they're just kind of left even with a little bit of uh melodic dissonance like maybe not everything is lining up perfectly musically but it's just kind of left as is because having these two kind of worlds colliding is just so weird uh for for me tracks kind of like close to the sun and sexual lion king are are definitely examples of that yeah those two in particular to me when i was making them uh i think gelled to my ears a little better than they do to everyone else's uh, and I don't know if that's just because I was working at them for a long time and trying to make them sound right, and eventually my ears just told me, like, oh, yeah, that sounds perfect. That sounds... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's harmonically good. Or if it's that I, I... I I understand a little more about music theory than other people. So to me, it's like a note that sounds discordant to someone. To me, it's just like, oh, that's just, you know, that's a, a second note. You know, that happens in music. That's not that weird. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's also, I think it's just a, the, there are so many melodies on these records that I'm just used to hearing a certain yeah. way. And, you know, against a certain kind of, uh, I guess, instrumental background as far as what the chord progression is doing. But uh, there are so many melodies out there that can work under completely different chord progressions, but they sound a completely different way emotionally under mm-hmm. that other instrumental backdrop. And it's, it's, 
I guess kind of a, a I don't know it's it's like this weird bit of musical anachronism or something uh, as as I'm kind of hearing you know <laughs> sexual healing with Elton John over it and I'm just kind of used to hearing or thinking one thing but I'm actually hearing another and I can't quite figure out whether or not it's not working because my memory just doesn't want it to work or if it's like actually not working technically yeah i would love for someone to who like knows music theory to like take like that yeah that that track in particular apart and just figure out if i'm actually doing something incorrect with that um or i I could probably just sit down on a piano and just like play out the notes that elton john is singing and the chords that marvin Gaye is playing and figure out if i am actually Mm making something that is discordant or if it is just a your um your associations with the track and your memories of the track uh fighting <laughs> like a like a virus or a new heart you know <laughs> absolutely and and there's a and yet there are other songs on here i mean just on <laughs> The Mouth Sounds record, I mean, I, I think the mashup with uh, Modest Mouse is really the f- perfect track to kick that whole thing off because it's it's almost as if they were meant to be together. Yeah, that one was, the, that was an easy one. That was like a gimme. It was just like, yeah, these, yeah. It, it was <laughs> like, okay, it's, it's, it sounds like to pull it together it was easy, yeah. but w- like, what, what, like... <laughs> What was it like when the moment dawned on you where it's like, this works? I I imagine it's sort of something like, I don't know, finding the cure for polio or something like that. (laughs) It can be. You just just throw your arms up in the air and it's like, I've done it! It definitely can be. I I think I made that one like a year before Mouth Sounds came out. So it was before I... It was like the second Smash Mouth mashup I did. And I forget why I decided. I think I just found the stems for both songs and I was just like, oh, these go together. They're both major key, anthemic, first chorus, first chorus songs. It just works. It's fine. Um, But I think as I was putting mouth sounds together and I was putting that track in there, the aha moment I had was realizing that the opening track, which was a modest Mussorgsky song, yeah, uh, <laughs> and the song that I wanted to be the second track was "Modest Mouth." That was my aha mm-hmm. moment where I was like, "That's such a weird synchronicity that I accidentally uh, mashed up." You know, this song with two artists who go by the name Modest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I keep running into those weird coincidences when I'm doing mashups. A lot of them aren't intentional at all. Yeah, well, it's it seems like, you know. Because I've I've shown people that mashup, who are less familiar with those two songs and have sort of been under the assumption that that's sort of you know the way the track is originally supposed to be, mm-hmm. or you know oh I thought the instrumental to this was a little different before, when in fact it's like oh yeah it's actually a completely different song, uh, so yeah it's it's just kind of one of those weird meant to be moments uh sort sort of like how uh, uh you pulled together smashing pumpkins uh and and what was it that uh working for the weekend uh that just sort of seemed to work it not only the front way but sort of the reverse way that you sort of displayed on the back end of the track i mean you know again is it just kind of this uh, uh um the the word i'm trying to think of here is uh uh you're just kind of just randomly trying things and just seeing if it works or is there some kind of like digital sorcery going on here where you know you're using these editing programs to you know find out whether or not these tracks work together before you're even pulling them together yeah there's like a little bit of a testing period for a lot of ideas i get and i'm sure i've tried out quite a few that just didn't work at all for whatever reason and i just go through the list and until i find um, something that seems good. I, and I think that one in particular, I forget why I did it. I think um, I wanted to do something with the Smashing Pumpkin song. Again, an artist with smash in the title. I didn't mean that to happen, but <laughs> there's a lot of like, yeah, there's a lot of verbal puns going on in the album that I somehow stumbled upon. But uh, 
that song was kind of a minor meme in its own right. I I think everybody knows the world is a vampire and like gets excited when they hear those words. <laughs> so I just wanted to do something with that, and I always loved the working for the weekend song too. And I I just tried them together, and I realized that uh, it it just clicked clicked really well. And then I got bored halfway through and tried it the other way, and that clicked really well. And um, and then at some point. I had to bring it back around, and uh, that's probably my one of my favorite tracks on Mouth Sounds. I think just because of how well those two work together. Do, I've I've heard a lot of people, and this, this is something that I'm just thinking of right now. I've heard a lot of people kind of decry the era of modern music because of uh, how homogenous it is. And in a way, doesn't this project, unintentionally, of course, also kind of prove that same point in a way that we can have these modern pop songs that we perceive to be com- from completely different worlds musically and like quality wise. I think your average person would look at a band like Smash Mouth, your average maybe snooty indie fan look at a band like Smash Mouth and sort of think of their music as crap, but praise a band like Modest Mouse. But uh, uh, the band's music, <laughs> at least in this one instance of these two singles, can fit right on top of one another, uh, just completely in lockstep and uh, and actually you know work in terms of key and tempo and rhythm and all that stuff. Uh, isn't this some kind of signal that maybe you know modern music is sort of I guess lacking in in ideas if we can just have all of this music that just sort of works together if we just throw it on top of each other. Uh, I uh, I don't know, like, cause I like to I like to um uh I do like to deliberately mix a song that's better regarded uh, in the canon with something that is kind of considered. A little bit trashy or or bubblegum poppy or something um hmm. and not to make that exact point but to explore how you know the similarities and the nuances that make them different um, but that's also i guess kind of why i've gone to a couple classical songs is because it goes I, I like to think that it goes even further back than that um sure on Mouth Silence, I used the uh, the Monty Python theme song, which is, you know, an old song by Philip Sousa, and I stuck Bon Jovi over that, and, you know, they're both just marches, basically. <laughs> they, uh, they evoke a lot of the same emotions. Um, and, uh, again, if people knew how many failed experiments I also had in the making of this, I think they, you know, they they could see like how different songs could be as well, you know, and how, Hmm. uh, songs are totally, are often very incongruent and, um, yeah. uh, Yeah. No, No, uh, well, I mean, not, not to sort of (laughs) put you in a position of answering this, I'm not, I'm not asking you this question like it's a crime that so much music is the yeah. same or anything like that, but it's it's just interesting to sort of see how little the musical world can kind of be uh, in in such a way where you can throw a, a Sousa march underneath a Bon Jovi vocal and it just kind of works. Yeah, I think it helps that I'm not very judgy when it comes to music. I guess and I I like I like. Um, I like to, you know, hold my finger in the wind and and see what people think of certain songs and artists compared to others and and uh, think about that when I'm doing a mashup, but ultimately I am trying to find something that you can appreciate in, you know, two or more songs, even if it's just a snippet here and there or if it's uh or it, or if the first blast of the song is supposed to be a joke where it's distasteful. Um, I, I do like that a lot of them by the end of the song uh, just you know they kind of work and they, they are kind of listenable to me anyway yeah I, I mean I would I would say quite a bit of the, the two records uh, especially Mouth Silence are incredibly listenable uh, uh, I'm always for, for whatever reason and, and this is just my personal 
you know, experience with the record, but I always find myself going back to Piss, mm-hmm. even though it's maybe one of the sillier songs on the record, but for whatever reason, I just find the uh, the bass and drum groove under it like completely irresistible and just the way that the third eye blind yeah. and the Jumbawamba lyrics come together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and also, what, maybe one of my favorite cuts off of mouth sounds uh is this really weird moment that I, I don't think it's a mashup unless you're kind of pulling the uh, some of the melodic ideas from someplace else. But I love the track where you kind of flip Chocolate Rain because I, I think in a way you sort of pull out this weird... Not, not, on, not only do you incorporate these weird psychedelic and electronic elements that I think are, are really cool to begin with, but I think in this kind of new... I guess, musical aesthetic with all this atmosphere and just, you know, some better production because that song originally is pretty demo quality. Mm-hmm. I think you've kind of given the track this uh, weird beauty that Tay may have intended for it to have when he was originally composing it in his head, but obviously he had his limitations with sort of recording in the video so that, you know, it just kind of looked silly to your average person. Uh, <laughs> did you see some kind of, I don't know, potential in that song before you started on it or was it just kind of a joke like many of the other tracks were at the very start and it kind of turned into something else i think that one i was trying to get a little clever with taking a song that i know everybody remembers as a meme that was really ubiquitous on the internet at a certain point and everybody laughed at and uh it's just like one of the the obvious like really silly songs that you could sample and 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 playing it really straight instead of mm. making a joke out of it like I did with Smash Mouth. And that song in particular was a really good song to do that with because the lyrics are, of course, very serious when you listen to them. And it's about racism and it's about things that are very personal to Tay Zonde. And uh, it's a, like, it's, yeah, it's like a, it's a weird story musically, like that song and its popularity um so I tried to kind of I I mean I was it, it was just an experiment. I was just messing around with vocoder effects and echoes and trying to make it sound pretty while also using this vocal track that everybody knows and is, you know, kind of silly sounding and and uh I think would elicit a laugh from most people who were around when that song became viral um mm-hmm. and not really having but but using that song as a setup without having a real punchline to it i don't know it was i, I stuck it in the middle of the album because i thought it'd be a nice little palette cleanser before the rest of the jokes continued on i don't know why i did it but i uh like at the time it just seemed like yeah i'm using similar kind of ingredients of old memes and songs that were popular but don't hold up in some way and just doing something really different and unexpected with it i think uh uh, and and i kind of did a little personal vlog about this uh just the other day because somebody was asking me sort of how i react to or what i think of the fact that people sort of make memes about me or uh, about what i do and how i sort of balance continuing to do what I do and and take myself seriously and have other people take me seriously, but sort of uh, have these ongoing memes about me as well. And it kind of feels like uh, meme culture all uh, often kind of gets this, uh, and and I understand why, but often gets this, uh, I guess this, uh, this public opinion about it, that it's just really dumb. It's really shallow and there's nothing really to it, which I, I do enjoy the simplicity of it, but I think that it can also be kind of nuanced as well, uh, you know, because, I mean, I think a lot of the humor that you incorporate on these records, I mean, some of it's meme influence, but a lot of it is very clever, and, and I think that this track in particular, you trying to take a meme, I mean, you, you take these songs that you say are sort of more critically acclaimed in the canon of modern music and putting them together with these trashy songs, showing their similarities, but also kind of eliciting this uh, maybe an ugly response from people 
who might be stumbling across what you're doing. But I think in a, in a really weird and unexpected way, you're kind of taking something that people would usually regard as a meme, but uh, treating it seriously in a sense. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just like a weird 180 from the rest of the album, but I I realized that at the time, and you know that's why I stuck it right in the middle, so you could recover from it. I guess I don't know. It's uh, it is yeah, it is one of the tracks I like more on that album, um, and I don't know exactly what I was trying to say with it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I I don't know. It was just pretty, and I thought people would uh appreciate a pretty version of a song that they haven't heard as pretty in a long time if ever yeah sure i i think um also i i, I met tazon day a couple years ago yeah. um or last year i after the album came out i saw him at a convention and i think we'd met like like five years before that or something and i like so i walked up to him and was like do you remember me we won youtube awards <laughs> years ago um and i don't know if you remembered me but i tried to explain to him that i had sampled chocolate rain on my mashup album and that uh uh everything on the album is a joke making fun of the music except that track i really respect your track <laughs> and i it was like a really awkward as i was trying to explain to this guy who i, I don't know how he feels about that track or the memes surrounding yeah. it as, as far as i can tell he's been uh, like a really good sport and very confident about it and just like proud of all the many, many remixes people have done of it. Um, and he's an odd guy, but yeah, he seems cool in that respect to me. Um, but he just kind of like nodded his head and said like, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and that was that was it. I, I wasn't able to uh, pique his interest <laughs> as far as I can tell. Well, uh, let, let me know if he ever approaches you about having heard the track, if he has any reaction to it. But I know recently, uh, uh, and, and this was a guy who actually tweets at me quite regularly. Tay Zonde? Um, oh, oh. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, I'm talking about um, you had shared a screenshot of somebody sharing your mashups with Smash Mouth. Oh, yeah. And, and, that, and that guy is, uh, has actually tweeted at me quite frequently. Uh. And I, I know he sees my reviews, and uh, so when I saw you post that image, I was like, "Holy shit!" You know, not only is it that dude, but Smash Mouth, he got a reaction from Smash Mouth on your music. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know that. I, mean, I don't know who that guy is, but I, I think I was just like looking for people who had shared the link recently, and I saw his post at Smash Mouth, and I saw Smash Mouth's reply, uh, <laughs> and I thought it was just hilarious. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I, I think the perfect ending to this would be for them to, you know, sort of, sort of do a cover of your mashup of Float On and All Star. I mean, I think, I think that's really the. I would love the to. I would love to, to get uh, <laughs> their their manager and uh, Modest Mouth's manager together and like put a show on together, and it could happen. They were close enough in the time frame. I know Smash Mouth sure. tours around with Sugar Ray a lot. I think they're more in each other's wheelhouse, but maybe Modest Mouth could get in on that tour. I don't mm -hmm. know what they're doing. <laughs> um, but they actually... I think Smash Mouth did acknowledge and they, uh, the Daft Punk mashup. They posted it on their Facebook mm -hmm. at some point. Um, so I already knew that Smash Mouth had heard at least one track. So mm -hmm. this guy like just tweets it at Smash Mouth, and the official Smash Mouth Twitter replies... THX, as in thanks, with a comma yeah. and nothing after the comma. <laughs> so it just like uh, vocally, I imagined it like thanks, like they've heard it a million times. Uh, Maybe they've heard thanks. it a million times. Maybe they were in the midst of a really involved reply, hence the comma. Yeah, and then they were just interrupted. They never wrote back. Maybe they never the said anything else. So I screenshotted it and. <laughs> What was amazing was I had already been kind of messing around with taking some Smash Mouth vocals and combining it with the THX uh, deep note sound. Hmm. So I was like, oh, I have to finish this up and release it. So I like very quickly finished that up in like five minutes and posted it. <laughs> um, so now like the Smash Mouth THX 
is a real song inspired by Got a tweet. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, man. <laughs> this has been this has been really this has been in a very enlightening dive into two of my favorite records of last year. Uh, if 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 there's one more thing I I think I should ask you before we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I even before these mashup records, I had uh, been, I guess, uh, in a way peripherally conscious of you through Brody Quest, mm-hmm. which I think you know a lot of people have probably caught that video over the years. Uh, I remember a long time ago, uh, probably not too. It was it was maybe like a little while after the the video started going viral. One of the top comments was like, "I'm related to Adrian Brody, and he's seen this video." Yes. <laughs> Um, that that was definitely an amazing moment because when that video caught on, I remember <laughs> at least seeing it and revisiting it several times. Um, and uh, you, you just seem like this uh, creative type who always has a lot of irons in the fire and is always kind of embarking on a new project and whatever. It's It seems like you will kind of do this one project for a while until maybe you've exhausted everything from it or maybe something else has kind of caught your attention i mean is this whole mashup sort of thing still on the front burner or do you kind of feel your uh, creative juices flowing in another in another direction right now i uh, th- there are a lot of fun to make and i've made a few more that i've posted to soundcloud in the last few months yeah. uh i'm not actively working on an album of mashups right now because i i kind of realize i need to get back to doing original music i have been releasing music as lemon demon since i was like 16 and um, yeah. there's plenty of fans of that music. And I haven't put out a proper album of non-mashup music since 2008. And I have one that's almost finished now. So so I'm just, like, focusing on that. And I, like, you know, I don't want to waste time on silly mashups that I can't really make money off of. So <laughs> that's, that's great. I mean, we'll share that around Thank when you. that's out. Um, yeah, that's pretty much done. Um, uh, yeah, so it's... It's not that I don't want to do mashups anymore. It's it's more that I feel guilt for spending so much time on mashups for a few months there last year. Um, so yeah, I've just been holding back on them, but I I keep revisiting that archive of of uh, rock band stems, and uh, I have a few things I keep trying out and different combinations. So I, I think it's in the back of my mind that I'll probably do a third one at some point after. After I've gotten my big I, projects I can, out of the way. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I completely understand. I mean, <laughs> I, I can only imagine how basically time-consuming pulling these albums together was. And and obviously editing some of the more detailed tracks. I, at the time, and, it felt and then, very fast. Like, it just kind of like... I think Mouth Silence came out two months after Mouth Sound. So it was fast. Yeah, it's, it was a very fast turnaround. Yeah. I mean, it's... It was, at least from me observing outside, it was almost as if you had been working on both of these for years and just decided no, I gotta, <laughs> to release them both at the same time. I don't think I worked on anything else at the time because mm. I was just like, oh, mm. I got to put out a second album for some reason. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I did. But yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of work compressed into a short time, I guess. But then at sort of the end of it, you've got to kind of just give it all away for free, which I mean, still, I mean, that's as an artist, that's your time that that you want to see some kind of uh, uh, benefit from. Uh, and and I imagine that you can't <laughs> necessarily pull together a band and sort of tour behind all these crazy. No, I, I've had some luck with the there's little donate buttons on the pages for both albums. Hmm. And I've gotten some pretty generation uh, generous donations from people. And I, you know, something comes in every few days, basically, you know, big or small, which is really nice of people because I I put them up with zero expectation. And I just thought like, oh, it might be nice might be nice i've never really done a donation button before i might as well try it out it's a new toy (laughs) so and i also i started up a patreon uh just for general purpose stuff because i do it's my default mode is to put up something that i can't monetize directly because it's a Hmm. uh, it's an alteration of something else it's a photoshop of something or it's a remix or a mashup or or a tweet or a joke or something. So Patreon is good because you can kind of, in the abstract, sell what you're doing without having specific products that 
can be purchased. Um, mm-hmm. So, so yeah, the 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 mashup albums kind of like changed how I thought about uh, uh, earning money on creative projects. But I, it, it is still kind of uh, it is in a separate category from things that are wholly owned by me that I can sell a physical CD or MP3s of online. So I, yeah, I'm just trying to like get back into making a nice polished traditional album where I sing on it and uh, I don't owe anybody any royalties <laughs> and it's mine <laughs> well good Thank luck you. on that man thanks for uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast and just talking about what you're doing and talking about these two insane mashup records oh, thank you is this a new podcast or pretty... uh, we are I think we are maybe six or seven episodes oh, cool. in so I think, yeah. the podcast has been in an existence before but now we're sort of reformatting it as kind of like an interview show. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. I will check it out. Um, I like podcasts. They're good. Yeah. All right. Great. <laughs> well, again, thanks for being on. Yeah. Dude. Thank you so much for having me. Again, this was Neil C. Sarego. We will be linking you in the description box, not only to some of his Lemon Demon stuff, some of his YouTube exploits, uh, but also these two mashup albums he pulled together last year, Mouth Sounds and Mouth Silence. <gasps> uh, forever. <laughs>